Let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, again, I am so glad to see everybody. Uh, thank you guys. And as Nellie has already uh, put forth, it's really good to be inside, isn't it? <laughs> you know, this is probably one of the few times we'll say, hey, this Zoom is a really good way to do things. Uh, the other being a blizzard, but uh, Lord willing, that won't happen. Uh, <laughs> um, we have uh, uh, a couple of things that uh, I want us to be aware of. First of all, um, Thelma's funeral or family is, is putting that together and coming up finalizing all of the plans for that. But that is going to be a, a small um, affair. And uh, Deb sent out, um, okay, Sherry sent out, uh, you know, some instruction from Deb and I about that. Uh, obviously in this day and age COVID, there's certain limitations. Right. Uh, at funerals, so uh, everyone won't be able to participate, but there is a way to send flowers, to send cards, to do all of that. So if you will just check your email, Sherry sent that out from Deb and I, and that'll have all of the information that you need on it. And there'll be more um, because of the y YWCA okay. thing coming up, they're opening up to the church. So we just have to get an instruction to do that. Got it. Uh, yeah, this is a late breaking bulletin. We just found out today, uh, Thelma worked at the YWCA and uh, they want to do something, have a, a, a memorial service for her there. And that will allow a lot more people to come. Uh, again, that's, we just found out today that's not been officially put together. They're looking at Tuesday so we will get that out. I'll have Sherry get that out as soon as we can find out uh, the details and the limitations uh, on that service as well. Um, you know, one thing I, I did want to say is I want to commend all of you. Uh, reading Larry's weekly note that he sends out to New Jersey and just highlighting uh, the way God has stirred your hearts and your generosity. You know, it was it just did my heart good to see how many people this year we've been able to help both in the church, both outside, uh, different ministries we help, you know, in other parts of the world. And it's all come from the way that God has stirred your hearts to be generous. Uh, that's one thing about the New York church that's always inspired me is, you know, we talk about a disaster somewhere. We talk about, wow, there's this big need people are in need. And I mean, <laughs> the generosity is, is overwhelming. And guys, just thank you so much for allowing God to stir your heart that way. Amen. Um, just to be part of a solution and to help people out in some really, really trying times. Amen. Uh, I'm going to ask <laughs> Ted and Mackie at this time, if they would, to please lead us in a prayer. Uh, Ted has a couple of the prayer requests there, but also just those, uh, our country, uh, everything's going on, and our time tonight. Amen. 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 Father God, good evening. Thank you so much for this time we have to be together, to worship you, to learn from you, to learn how we can be more like you and your son. Amen. Thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you for your guidance. We pray so much, Father, that our hearts will be open and that we'll want to learn and grow and just really live a life that reflects our relationship with you and how Amen. much you love us. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his salvation. Thank you for giving us a hope and a future. Father, I pray so much for our country. I do pray, Lord, that you will let us as disciples be the beacon to our, to our neighbors, the beacon to the world, mm -hmm. that people will see what it is to love and to heal and to grow. Yes. And to, and to love one another and to be what we need to be to help us move together forward as a community. I pray mm -hmm. for our leaders of this country, that Father, that you will give them wisdom and perception and the heart to want to help us be the best uh, country we need to be, Father. 
that will bring us together as one people living together for the, for the greater good. Father, I thank you for our church. I thank you for the leaders of the church. I thank you so much for every disciple in the Garden State Church in the North region. I just thank you so much, Father, for the way you've called us and the way you put us together to serve you. I pray that we can love each other deeply from the hearts, that Father, we can be people that will, that will love and our love will just be so evident to our neighbors that will be able to bring many more people to know you, Father, and enjoy this relationship that we have with you, this freedom that we have in your son's name. Amen. 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 Father, we ask that you uh, be with Thelma's family uh, to comfort them, Father. I pray that we're able to uh, be there as much as possible, uh, even though we may not be able to be numbers, uh, but uh, they feel our hearts, Father. I pray that we find different ways to reach out to the Balin family, uh, just to let them know that we're thinking and praying for them. But we especially ask that you uh, draw really close to them, Father, and help them during this time. Uh, we especially ask you for the, uh, the Babel family. Aaliyah uh, said that she was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, I know the Babels were just such a great family to be here. Uh, in, in New Jersey and now they're in North Carolina. Uh, but I know this has gotta be a really rough time for them. I yeah. pray that you give them incredible faith uh, yeah. and that you uh, really comfort their heart also. Yeah. And uh, as much as anything, Father, that uh, you help this uh, cancer to be cured uh, and there's no residual effects, Father, to bring her through uh, healthy uh, and better than she was before, Father. Yeah. Uh, again, we thank you so much for grace. Yes. Father, we know that there's a lot of situations. There's so many things going on. You know each and every one of them. Mm -hmm. Father, we know that uh, you're working out each and every one of them. Mm -hmm. And Father, I pray that you just help us to stay faithful, mm -hmm. loving, and really uh, patient and waiting on your will, Lord. But knowing that you're in total control and that you are here to bless us and not to harm us, Father. Amen. Thank you again for this evening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Um, I wanted to start off tonight and just listen to this scripture. Don't worry, I'll put it up on the screen in, in just a little bit. But just uh, listen to it from 1 Peter 4, verse 8. Above all... Love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. There have been many times in my life as a Christian where things just weren't going well. Uh, things on the outside weren't going well. Things on the inside weren't going well. There were times I, I you know, I felt stale. I felt a little bored. There are times I felt different attitudes or different anxieties. And, you know, people talk about, well, faith and, and how wonderful it is. And it's great to be a Christian. And, you know, I, I kind of, okay, I, I agree. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble being there. And it's like, you know, where do I start? How do I, how do I kind of, quote, get it back? The, the passion, the, the faith, the expectation you know, obviously, anytime that I want my environment to change and waiting on that to change, I'm in trouble because <laughs> there are times that has its own mind. People have their own mind, so I can't depend on that. So it's, it's something from within has got to be different. Of course, that's the way God had always designed it for his people, those that are redeemed as, you know, his spirit lives in us. So the, the change does come from within. But he wants us to want to be that way, to want to start again. And uh, I remember something, and th this has helped me, but it was a lesson that was taught to me 44 years ago, 44, 45 years ago. I was a couple years old as a Christian. And uh, there was a, a friend of mine and this, was, this person was an incredibly talented individual. I mean, 
kind of like one of these people could speak, could do a lot of things. I mean, incredible in leading people and helping people, you know, just amazing. Well, they kind of went off to do some graduate work. And while they did that, they just started to come unraveled spiritually and started to go through a lot of things spiritually and basically ended up in a real dark place. And I remember hearing about it. I'm, I'm kind of like, wow, not them. That's just, that's weird. Anyway, they came back to where I was to be part of that church there, coming back just to see if, can I just get revived again? You know, because I feel like I messed up. I, you know, and it was an interesting thing because when they came back, all they started to do was serve people. I mean, this was a person that was leading things, but didn't want any, didn't expect any, didn't want any, just wanted to help people and would go around and uh, serve people and encourage people and all of that. And I remember one time I was sitting with another friend of mine. It was a Friday night devotional and we saw this person walk by and we're seeing the effect in people's lives of people being encouraged and cared about. And, and the person who was sitting with me looked over at me and goes, you know what? The reason he is where he is now, coming back, having a great impact, is because he always kept loving. And I always remembered that. Even when he, you know, where did he start? Where could he do? He said, you know what? I just want to come back. I want to love God and love people. That's all I want to do. And that's where I'm going to start. And when I see this scripture, I think about not only him, I think about me, the times in my life where discouraged, you name it, it's like, man, I just need to start over. Father, what do I do above all else? above all else, Sheridan, above all else, love one another deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't matter to me if you've had your heart's been somewhere else, if you've had attitudes and all of that, and you just think, I just don't think I can get it back. You know what? That's not my concern. I want you to know if you want a place to start, start with love above all else start with love now here's the kicker that sounds like a nice hallmark card doesn't it hey start with love and life's gonna be great man i can remember in the late 60s many of you weren't even born yet but the beatles did a international television show on love and they were singing the song, All You Need Is Love. And it was great. And, you know, this is going to help the civil rights in the Vietnam War and ah, da, 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 da. Have you looked at our society recently? What happened? All you need is love. You see, everyone knows how important that is. And I was so excited that the squad and the teachers are doing, teaching those classes on loving one another. If you felt like things are stale, you need to be part of that class. You need to go learn because that is the place to start. First John 4, 16 says, God is love. It's interesting. There are few places in the New Testament, you know, uh, that says God is something. And you need to pay attention to those because those are things that God does not decide to do. Those are things he is. He cannot help but be loving. I have to decide to. He doesn't. He is loving. So tonight, I, I do want to, it's interesting, when I found out and saw those classes being offered, uh, I wanted to go over some things I'd shared with Staten Island um, on a similar vein. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. Let me see. 
Okay. The testing of our love. A couple of times ago, you know, we talked about the testing of our spirituality. We talked about the testing of our humility. Uh, tonight, I want to talk about the testing of our love. And next time, we'll talk about the testing of our courage. And the theme scripture that we were using for this was James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Trials come and test our faith. Our faith is the foundation for everything in our relationship with God, and it is the foundation of our love. Our love comes from the faith we have in God, from his spirit, and we're going to talk about more of that in a second. So the testing of our faith will happen in things that test our love. And it is our perseverance in continuing to love, though tested, that per perseverance will cause our love to become mature and complete. No Christian ever needs to say, I'm not a loving person. Usually when they say that, they have a misunderstanding about what that means, and we'll talk about that. But I want you to know this, it is God's will and intent for all of us to be mature and complete in love. And yet the world we live in is going to test that. When we talk about love in a Christian sense, we're talking about agape. There are four words for love in the Greek language. And if you are acquainted with the Greek language, um, if Steve Kennard's on the uh, uh, Zoom tonight, I apologize because I shall butcher the pronunciation here, but just Hang with me and realize that there's somebody that does know how to correctly pronounce it, okay? But I do know this. There are four words in Greek that define love. Greek is a lot more specific than English. Christian love is agape. We will talk about that. But the three other types of love, there's eros, and that is mainly used the love between the sexes. Uh, the sexes. It's sexual love. It's attraction. It's, you know, I want to date this person. I want to marry this person. I want, you know, those feelings. That's a type of love. That's eros. There's storge. Storge is used for family affection. You know, you can bicker about family, but if someone does something to your brother, your sister, it's like, hey, wait a minute. That's my brother, my sister. That feeling of care and connection, that's that storge. That's a different type of love, but it's love. It's love. And then there's philia. And philia is probably the one that we think about most often. Uh, this means to look at someone with affectionate regard to cherish. I mean, you can do this with, you know, your, your, your spouse. You can do this, a girlfriend, boyfriend. You can do this with just a good friend. I value our friendship. You mean a lot to me. It's not a, a, a sexual thing, or not, but there's a, a cherishing, a man, you make my life so much better. You make me feel safe, secure, encouraged. I need you. That's the philia. And that's, that's an important love. Now, the thing is, all of us it can experience these three, eros, storge, and philia, by the fact that we're created in the image of God. And even though sin has come into the world and has caused us to, to get tarnished in this area, we can still experience it because that's who we are by creation. We have able to do this. But the other love is the one that sets us apart as Christians, not just human beings, but Christian human beings. All humans can do eros, storge, and philia to a certain degree. Christians 
are the ones that are allowed to experience agape. And in the New Testament, that is the word that's used over and over and over again whenever it's describing the love that Christians have for either God or mankind. 99% of the time, that's going to be the word that's used. I want you to notice something about eros, storge, and philia. Each of the, these three are limited to the desirability or lovability of the person or object loved. Agape is unlimited and not based on either lovability or desirability. In other words, those other three loves depend on something about the object being lovable or desirable. Agape doesn't need that. The object can be totally unlovable, totally undesirable. That does not stop agape. This is a higher type of love. This is the love that God exhibits himself. It is unlimited and it is not based on the lovability or desirability. So when Peter says above all else, agape each other that's not the verb of the word agape i'm using now but love one another have this type of love that's not based on whether the person deserves it or not this is the highest form of love so let's look at this agape in action look over at matthew 5 Verses 43 through 48. Jesus speaking here, what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is bringing God's way into this earth. The kingdom is coming. This is a whole different way of life. It is real life. It is what people were created for. And so in this teaching, he talks about this type of love a different way. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The agape that you and I have within us and the agape we give will be tested by this world. But by persevering in it, we will be perfect. We will be complete. And we will be like our Father in heaven. I want to read a quote here. And this is from William Barclay. I've, I've got to go to the next slide to finish it. Uh, Barclay wrote a book called New Testament Words. The first chapter in that book is on agape and agapan, the verb there. To me, it's worth the entire book. You talk, or you want something to study about love? He does a great chapter and goes through all the references and explains uh, about agape. But I want you to listen to what he says about this in referring to this passage. We are there bidden to love our enemies. Why? In order that we should be like God. And what is the typical action of God that is cited? God sends his reign on the just and the unjust, and on the evil and the good. That is to say, no matter what a man is like, God seeks nothing but his highest good. That is to say, Christian love, agape, is unconquerable benevolence 
invincible goodwill. It is not simply a wave of emotion. It is a deliberate conviction of the mind issuing in a deliberate policy of the life. It is a deliberate achievement and conquest and victory of the will. It takes all of a man to achieve Christian love. It takes not only his heart, it takes his mind and his will as well. Agape love is a decision. I love how over and over again, this statement, he talks about it is a deliberate. Agape love doesn't wait to be, oh, wow, something just sparked out of me and I have this feeling of warmth toward this person. No, it is a deliberate act of the will. What is it? It is willing the highest good for the individual that you are loving. God sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous, the good and the evil. He doesn't wait. Let me, let me wait until this guy or this girl get good enough and now I'm going to do something. Let me wait till they're love, lovable. He does good things to atheists, to blasphemers, to people that curse him. He still sends good their way. You know why? God is agape. God is love. His love is is not based on my lovability, on me making everyone feel warm. No, he wills the highest good for me. Now, this is different in the world, and this is a challenge to be sure. It's so much. We want the philia. We want to, to cherish someone, and that cherish is based on you know, they're, they're, they give to us or they inspire us or they help us or there's something about them that just, oh man, it's great. But agape is on a whole different plane. Agape is God's type of love. It wills the highest good. It makes a decision. I will will the highest good for this person. Because it is seeking the highest good for somebody, it does not mean going along with or agreeing with or let people do whatever they want. Sometimes people say, okay, so let's love people. Uh, well, I'm going to be a Christian. So, uh, you know, whatever a person wants to do, I don't want to say anything because I'm a Christian. I just want to be loving. That's not agape love because that's not the highest good for the person. What if they're doing something wrong? What if it's something that could hurt someone else or hurt them? It's not good to go along with that. It's not good to say, hey, that's, even though that looks bad to me, I'm going to call it good just so I can be loving. No, that's not loving. That's not willing the highest good. Sometimes you got to take a stand and, and for the highest good of the person, say, no, I, you can't get your way. No, this is not good for you. Now, this spirit and manner in which we do it, is going to be important. You see, this is going to be tested and is tested in us, both within us and without. Within us, we say, I don't feel like loving them because they hurt my feelings. I'm not going to will the highest good for them because of what they've done to me or who they are or what they represent. That's from within. Also, we'll get pressure from without. Okay, if you're really a loving person, you're going to support me in all of this. Well, that may not be the highest good for you, though. That may not, but the pressure is going to be there, and we will be tested. So let's look at this real quick, and then we're going to close out. Four truths about agape, about Christian love. Truth number one, it comes from the Spirit. In Galatians 5 and in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is agape, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithful, and self-control. Go on down. 
That is the fruit of the spirit. That is not the fruit of Sheridan. The best I could do is, you know, philia, storge, eros. That I can do from my own, what's left of me. You know, God created me this way, so I can experience some of that apart from him. Agape, though, only is going to come from the Spirit of God. After living a total selfish life before as a Christian and then having to deal with selfishness on a daily basis since I've been a Christian, hey, the easiest thing in the world is wait for people to be lovable. Wait for people to be exactly who I need them to be so that I kind of like them. Now it's easy for me to, oh, I want the best for you. But what about people that aren't like that? What about people when sometimes personalities are just different, you know? Wow, this type of personality is a challenge for me. What about that? This love comes from the spirit of God himself. He has to bring this out in me. My part is I have to value that. I have to want that. I've got to say, God, I want to be loving I'm, I'm not. God is, as long as I like people, people do things my way. Hey, I'm, I care about them. I'm warm. I'm loving. But what about when they don't? What about when people have said things? I mean, that's why Jesus says, you, you love your enemies. You pray for those that persecute you. He uses the word enemy not to create contempt in our hearts toward people, but to show it's not based on the lovability of the person. You want the best for them. What is the best? That's something you'd be praying about. God, I need to love this person or these people. What is the best? I'm not sure I even know what the highest good is, but here I am. I'm open. And this is things we spend our quiet times on. These are things that will change our hearts but we have to value it. It's got to be important to us, more important than just me. You know, if I make it all about me, no agape in that. The best I got is philia or storge or something like that, but no agape. Yet, if the spirit of God is in me, I have the power to do this. I can remember uh, my first preacher, uh, after I became a Christian. I remember one time he said, you know, if you ever feel like your relationships are just getting shallow or you're feeling distant or not that warm, tell you what to do. What, read 1 Corinthians 13 every day for a month and see what that does to you. You know what? He was right on the button. The very fact that I read 1 Corinthians 13 every day was symptomatic of the fact that I wanted that. I was open. God, please change my heart. You know, teach me the way of agape. Your spirit produces that. And at the end of that time, my heart was in a completely different place. So was everyone else that was doing that exercise because we agreed with the spirit of God on it, and he worked it out in our hearts. Second truth is that agape is a sign that you learn from Jesus. In John 13, the night Jesus is betrayed, he's spending his last hours prior to the betrayal and crucifixion with his disciples, and uh, again, another just amazing uh, uh, dialogue he has. But in it, he says in verse 34 of John 13, a new command I give you, agape one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You look at that group, you had a zealot and a tax collector. You had a braggart and a betrayer. You had a, you know, a, a, a timid person. You had some hot-tempered people. I mean, it was, 
it was not just, hey, everyone's kind of the same. He said, you know, the world can look at some groups of people and say, well, that's obvious. A lot of philea going on in there, philia, because they like each other. They, you know, join together. They are, you know, have common interests or something. That makes sense. And sociologists will say that's kind of what you do, you know, and makes sense. But it's the gape that shows who we're, we're being taught by. It is the way I express agape. I will the highest good. I, I am concerned in, in thought, in word, and in deed, how I express myself, how I live. That is That transcends everything. I will the highest good for everyone. And when people see that, they think, this guy is being taught by somebody. Jesus knew that. He knew that, man, if people were going to know these guys are different, why are they different? Are they superhuman? No, they're just normal guys and girls. They're just typical. Something is different. It's that ability. It's that lifestyle of willing the highest good, the way they treat each other, the way they treat others. It's a sign that, you know what? I listen to Jesus. He's my teacher. I'm his learner, his disciple. Teach me, Lord. Third truth is that agape is a sign that I have passed from life, I'm from death to life. In 1 John chapter 3, John says this, says in verse 14, <clears throat> we know that we have passed from death to life because we agape each other. Anyone who does not agape remains in death. Um, Agape is just a sign of my connection to God. I, it, it's a sign that I've passed from death to life. The fact I'm experiencing it. Oh, I, I'm not perfect. And we're not talking about, wow, you got it made. You do it all. But, you know, that's the conviction. This is the way I need to live. It's deliberate. I am deliberately going to will the best for people. In the world, and the test is, hey, react get even, do whatever, but I want to will the best. But the ability and the experience of doing that is a sign that, you know what? I have passed from death to life. I'm in a different kingdom. It's the, the, the first Peter two thing. You know, once I was not a people, I am the people now, you know, uh, once I had no mercy, I do have mercy now. What's the sign of that? Agape. My experience of willing the highest good, of not waiting for people around me to be lovable according to my idea of lovability or desirable, but what is the highest good for them? Maybe a kind word, maybe a listening ear, maybe a, let me just stop and think and, and let me try and take in what's going on. Um, I've told some of you that I've shared this with, you know, when, when everything came out with uh, the feelings people had in light of George, George Floyd and what happened, you know, it caught me off guard because I thought we don't have a problem with that. Now, that was easy for me to say something like that, but I thought here in the church, yeah, we, you know, and I started, brothers and sisters would talk to me and how it made them feel, and then they started sharing with me some of their realities, and I'm kind of like, oh my gosh, okay, all right, so it's like, you know, what's the highest good right now? Listen, learn. 
And that goes not only in the racial sense, that can go in a lot of other senses. Everyone's not me. And just because I see something a certain way or think something a certain way, let me be open. When a brother or sister is hurting or has something that's hard for them, let me just listen and learn. That's the highest good. I want every single person in the church to feel safe, to feel valued. I don't want that because, hey, listen, vent some. It's the way God made it. It's not my idea. It's the command of God Almighty. And so what is the highest good? Man, I, I want to do whatever it takes for the highest good for people. And if I'm experiencing that and if I'm growing in that, it's a sign. You know what, Sheridan? You're living in a different kingdom, not the kingdom of the world, the old way. You, used to, you are really living in a different kingdom. And then the fourth last truth here, and this isn't the only truths about Christian love. I'm just doing this to give us something to feed on and to study and to think about. And I know you guys in those four classes are going to go even deeper, which is awesome. But the fourth truth, is a mathematical truth. Anything minus love equals zero. 1 Corinthians 13. You know, I, I can't tell. It's, it's interesting. Even in weddings that uh, between people that have no commitment to Jesus or necessarily belief in him, it's amazing, this passage will get read. And when I hear it, my prayer is, God, I hope, I hope they really come to know the meaning of this, what this is saying. Yes, it's great for marriage, but it's great for just life, all of us. But we've got to take hold of this truth. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. You know, it's a common thing to want to be a hero. Nothing wrong with that. You know, do something courageous to save someone's life. Some of you are first responders. You, you, that's almost like a way of life for you, and we definitely appreciate that. But there's something in us, you know, and, and that's good, you know, to, to, to do something heroic and be heroic. But, you know, there are times we can do things heroic, even Christian type heroic, that end up as nothing. Oh, maybe some people will say, hey, that's good. And, but, but in God's eyes, it's nothing. It's nothing. Why? We didn't love. It needs to be done in love. You know, I'd like to do something heroic, but how do I desire to do something heroic? Do I want misfortune to happen to somebody? That's terrible. If my heroism is contingent upon people's disaster, I mean, I don't want that. I pray that any class I teach, any sermon I preach, I beg God that I will do it out of love and a sincere desire, a determination that the highest good will come to everyone. Maybe some people won't help, but at least one person. If I get up and I'm Mr. Eloquent and I can put together all this stuff and oh, this is wonderful, but I did it because of my job or I did it you know, so that you would think something good of me or I did at that. In God's eyes, it's, it's, it's nothing. Some of the most powerful lessons did not come eloquently to me, 
it came from a brother or a sister who maybe shy, didn't talk that much, but they loved me enough to tell me something that was for my highest good. And I remember it to this day. Wow, that's, that's love. If I do something great, but don't do it because I love and I will the highest good for people. It's just, I'm just bringing attention to me. <clears throat> Anything minus love. I set up five studies this week. Amen. And I believe God can convert that person. Even if the person studying with them doesn't love, but for that person, the one that's studying, look, amen. But do you, are you willing the highest good for them? Wow. I, I worked in a soup kitchen. Amen. But did you do it for a, a badge of merit or did you do it because you're willing the highest good for people in need? You know, I just gave a bunch for special missions contribution. Amen. But did you do it just to get a tax break or to look good? Or did you do it because you're willing the highest good for others that you don't even see or know? on the other side of the world. Anything we do minus love equals nothing, nothing. So what do we need to do? Everything we do, God help me to do this with your spirit of agape. Please help me. We're not perfect, we're not complete yet, but as the world tests us, we are determined I will still pursue the way of agape. I will open my heart to the spirit. I will listen to Jesus' teachings. I will experience this. And I am not going to wait until other people are lovable, desirable. In my opinion, I'm going to will the highest good. Whatever that means, God give me the wisdom to do that. And so for the practical application, I just want to leave you guys this, and I hope you will uh, write this down, these uh, passages down here, just to go back and study on your own. And here's what I want you to think about. <clears throat> in what ways can I exhibit, and I'm going to read this in a second, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8, in thought, in word, and indeed toward the following two types of people. Christians in the church and those who are not Christians outside the church. The scriptures talk about God gives us direction on how to be loving toward these two types of people. Now, you can say, yeah, well, all hum humanity, that's right. But for those people that have decided I want to follow Jesus and, and, and learn from him and, and, and live in his kingdom, then what's the highest good? I mean, there are things that, that we got to be aware of for them. For those that are not yet Christians, yeah, we want them to become a Christian. But also, I don't expect a non-Christian to be a Christian if they don't want to be a Christian. But I still am going to love them. And that's, you know, the parable of the Good Samaritan. It just, the guy's in need. What's the highest good in this situation? So I want you to think about it. Thought, word, and deed toward these people. And just go through these passages and then think of situations and people and how you can do the highest good for them. Let me read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Agape is patient. Agape is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Agape does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Agape never fails. 
there are times that in our words and our deeds, we extend ourselves and, you know, even in our thoughts to will the highest good for a person. We've prayed about it. We've gotten some input. We know, you know, what to say and, and what to do. And there's no response. Or maybe there's a, uh, a disregard. I'm, I do not think that's in vain, guys. Love always trusts, always protects, always hopes, always perseveres. It never fails. You know, if the Lord doesn't come back again and I leave this earth, I still believe that those I have loved, I've willed the highest good for, that maybe didn't agree or maybe even didn't like me. But hey, there's still time. Something can jog their memory. God's still reaching out to them. He'll use other people. Our agape is never in vain. It never fails. We get to live in this life. We get to love God. We get to will the highest good for all people around us. And we get to grow and understand what that means. We're not perfect, but we are growing. We are heading in a direction. And as the world's going to test us in that, remember this, agape comes from the spirit, not from us. So we're going to be okay. We'll still be able to have this type of love. So I will leave this up here for uh, a few minutes so you can finish copying the scriptures. But I hope you will at some point go and just, you know, in a very practical way, look at how to thought, word, and deed. Uh, put 1 Corinthians 13, 4, and 8 into practice with these type of people. Thank you guys so much for this time. Um, I will uh, go ahead and open it up here in just a second. But um, Gary uh, Heredia, uh, brother, how about just closing us out in a prayer and then we can open it up for fellowship, okay? Uh, put your, uh, do your, uh, what you call it, unmute yourself. That's, that's the word I was looking for. Okay. Okay. All right, let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the way that you love us, the way you have uh, demonstrated that, how you are a personal God to each one of us and have done all that you can to uh, bring us into a relationship with you and how you have that unending love for those that don't know you yet. And... Uh, uh, may not even be searching for you, but hopefully we'll find you. Yes. We pray, Father, you'll help us in our hearts mm -hmm. to uh, put your word into practice, to love, mm -hmm. to really uh, care about one another, to care about the people that we're around from day to day. Mm -hmm. We just pray, Father, uh, to grow in that. Thank you for Sheridan and for him uh, sharing this message with us. And uh, we thank you so much for the ultimate gift of your love in your son, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And we pray in his name. Amen. Mm -hmm.